Prabhupada Jay, Prabhupada Jay, Prabhupada Jay, Prabhupada. Jaya Prabhupada, Prabhupada, Prabhupada Jay, Prabhupada. Jai Om Vishnupad Paramahamsa Pari Vraj Akacharya. Dr. Shat Shri Srimat, His Divine Grace, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj Prabhupada Ki. Jai Om Vishnupad Paramahamsa Pari Vraj Akacharya. Dr. Shat Shri Srimat, His Divine Grace, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasrati Thako Maharaj Ki. Jai. Anantakoti Vaishnava Rinda Ki. Jai. Uh, Iskon found the Acharya, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Nama Acharya, Srila Dahari Das Thako Ki. Prem Sekaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adwaita Gadadha Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Ki Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gopa Gopinath Shamakund Radha Kund Giri Govadhan Ki Jai Vrindavan Dham Ki Mai Por Dham Ki Ganga Mai Ki Jai Yamuna Mai Ki Jai Tulsi Devi Ki Jai Bhakti Devi Ki Sama Veda Bhakti Vrinda Ki Jai Gauda Pramanandi All glories to the assembled devotees all glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to Sri Sri Guru and Gauranga. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gananjara Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Jaina Tasmai Sri Guru Vainamaha Sri Chaitanya Manobishtam Shtapitam Jaina Bhutale Svaya Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Svapadantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestai Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swaminit Namane Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nivasesha Shunyavadi Paschata Deshatarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gauravakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Morning. This morning we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam's third canto, chapter 15, text number 19. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Okay, the description of the kingdom of God. Mandara kunda kura botpala champa karna. Punaga naga bakulambu japari jataha. Gander chite tu lasika barane natasya. Yasmin stapa sumana so bahumana yanti. Mandara kunda kura botpala champa karna. Punaga naga bakulambu japari jataha. Gander chite tu lasika barane natasya. Yasmin stapas manaso bahumana yanti. Please repeat. Mm. 
Mandarakunda Kurabot Pala Champakarna Punaganaga Bakulambu Japari Jataha Dante Chute to Lassicam Parane Natasia Yasmin's the Pasamana Sobahumana Mandara Kunda Chupala Champakarna Punaganaga Pakulambu Japari Jataha Ganter Chite Tulasika Marane Natasia Yasmin's the pass of Manaso Bahumana Yanti. Mandara Kunda Kura Botpala Champakarna. Punaga Naga Pakulambu Japari Jataha. Kunde Chite to Lassica Parane Natasia. Yasmin's the Pasamana so Bahumana Yanti. Hare Krishna. Word for word Mandara. Mandara, Kunda, Kunda, Kuraba, Let's see where this is going, Kuraba, Utpala, Utpala, Champaka, Champaka, Arna, Arna, Punaga, Punaga, Naga, Naga Keshara, Bakula, Bakula, Ambuja, Lily, Parijataha, Parijata, Gande, Fragrance, Archite, Being Worshipped, Tulasika, Tulsi, Abharanena, With a Garland, Tazya, Of Her, Yasmin, in which Vaikuntha? Tapa, posterity. Su Manasa, good minded, Vaikuntha minded. Bahu, very much. Manayanti, glorify. Oh, it's all up there. Oh, I see. Spoilers. Although flowering plants like the Mandara, Kunda, Gurabak, Utpala, Champak, Arna, Bunaga, Naga Keshara, Bakula, Lili, and Parijata are full of transcendental fragrance, they are still conscious of the austerities performed by Tulsi, for Tulsi is given special preference by the Lord who garlands himself with Tulsi leaves. Purport by His Divine Grace, Jal A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki Jai. The importance of tulsi leaves is very clearly mentioned here. Tulsi plants and their leaves are very important in devotional service. Devotees are recommended to water the tulsi tree every day and collect the leaves to worship the Lord. One time an atheistic swami <laughs> remarked, what is the use of watering the tulsi plant? It is better to water eggplant. By watering the eggplant, one can get some fruits. But what is the use of watering the tulsi? These foolish creatures, unacquainted, unacquainted with devotional service sometimes plays havoc with the education of people in general. The most important thing about the spiritual world is that there is no envy amongst the devotees there. This is true even amongst the flowers, which are all conscious of the greatness of Tulsi. In the Vaikuntha world entered by the four Kumaras, even the birds and flowers are conscious of service to the Lord. Okay. 
Before I begin, I would like to kindly request and beg the blessings of all the assembled devotees here that I may say something of use as I am new to giving Bhagavatam class. I am very humbled and honored to be here to be able to present something here and especially with such a beautiful verse. So um, let's begin. The two, major, the two major themes in this, uh, in this verse, and Prabhupada, of course, alludes to this in the purport, is the importance of tulsi, per austerities, and then conversely, the lack of envy in the spiritual world. So how is this applicable to our lives? Immediately, we can see that there are 11 flowers mentioned in this verse. Some, perhaps, well, I mean, I recognize lily. That's about it. <laughs> but beyond that, we can only hope to imagine and one day see and smell the transcendental fragrance of these flowers that exist in the spiritual plane. They must be large in size, small in size, very fragrant, very beautiful, something that's beyond perhaps our capacity here on this material world. So the attributes are very beautiful and it's even recognized here. But then Tulsi, Tulsi as we see her here in this form here as a plant, Perhaps externally, materially, she's simple. Just small green leaves and manjaris themselves are pretty and beautiful, but they're not what you would perhaps think transcendental in size and look. But she has a particularly special place uh, in uh, Vishnu or in Krishna's world or heart. Or lotus feet, I guess, is more apt. I was listening to a class on something similar to this and it was pointed out that these garlands these beautiful garlands and these flowers that he used for these deities here every single day unbelievable wouldn't it be amazing if their fragrance could last eternally forever you take it off and they're still i mean the garland team would probably think that's pretty ecstatic everyone else would think that's pretty ecstatic just to think these fragrance would last forever but these flowers here it says in vaikunta in the spiritual world they do you can pluck them and they're going to remain just as vibrant just as fresh as they would when they were on the plant themselves. So service, through and through, 108% service from start to finish, you know. But Tulsi is something different. And here especially it's mentioned that these other flowers actually take a step back when Tulsi comes along for some service. This seemingly humble, unsuspecting plant of flower comes to do some service. And with a non-envious spirit, these uh, these other flowers will actually step back and allow them to do some service. Why? Because they're aware of the austerities that she has performed. Even on our level here, we can observe that in the morning, particularly, the mode of goodness, the Brahma, humu, Brahma Muhurta hour, that the fragrance of Tulsi is particularly uh, strong. It says those in the mode of goodness or pure goodness, <laughs> they will... They are quite sensitive to that and they can appreciate Tulsi very much, even more so than the other flowers. And we'll see this coming up ahead in this, uh, in this exact, not chapter, in this uh, canto, the four Kamaras, how their life is changed just from the fragrance of Tulsi. But we'll get to that, that's maybe spoilers ahead. Big conversation. The following point of the lack of envy is highly significant to us in our life, as is the usage of Tulsi in our devotional lives and service. And we'll discuss that and why Srila Prabhupada was so emphatic about having us use or have Tulsi with us. Prabhupada mentions that envy is the beginning of material life, which is what we're entrapped in. So it's really important to understand what's keeping us here and what will help us leave here, even while still being here, to be in what you would say, Vaikunta consciousness. Hmm. So there were two places where the pastimes of Tulsi Devi were written, at least as far as I could find, that I could understand, was the Skanda Purana and this Brahma Vaivarta Purana. And it, des it describes how Tulsi 
wasn't and still isn't always just a plant here that we have access to like this, that she eternally resides in Goloka Vrindavan as Vrinda Devi. And due to, we won't go into it because it's like a rabbit hole like the Mahabharata. As soon as you talk about it, that'll be two weeks of talking Tulsi pastime, so we won't do it. But essentially, Vrinda Devi was sent down to earth and became Tulsi Devi. She desperately wanted Vishnu as a husband, and so she began to perform severe austerities, tens of thousands of years, kind of like Dhruva Maharaj, you know, standing on one leg, only surviving on water, surviving on breath, only, you know, like this. And then as this is happening in parallel, you have Sudama Brahmana from the spiritual world. Maybe you've heard one of the Gopas. He was also, for pastimes, Radharani sent him down here and appeared as a personality named Shankar Chuda. Why this is important? It's because that's who Tulsi married. So though Tulsi wanted to marry Vishnu, after her austerities for many, 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 many years, Lord Brahma turns up, as he does, after severe <laughs> austerities we read in the Shastras, he turns up and says, like, I'm paraphrasing, what's up? She says, well, I want Vishnu as a husband. I said, well, okay, but I've also made some other arrangements in the background here. You know, you've just got to trust me here. I highly suggest that you go and marry this Shankar Chuda. So this very fixed up devotee who eventually became kind of demoniac, very powerful, more powerful than the demigods. It's, you know, another war breaks out. And as I said, that's a rabbit warren. We won't go down, but nonetheless, the point of the story, how do we get... Tulsi from this story. Vishnu comes and fools Tulsi Devi as a part of this pastime to defeat Shankar Chuda was to, to weaken him by essentially affecting Tulsi in her person form, her chastity. So Vishnu arrives at her doorstep dressed as, looking as Shankar Chuda, her husband, so of course naturally is a very chaste, very faithful, unbelievably devotional, wonderful, wonderful personality. She welcomes him in, gives him a nice place to sit, offers some water, some nice words, as we do Vaishnav characteristics, Vaishnav qualities, bathes his feet, but then as that's happening, like, this isn't his feet, this isn't my husband's feet, what's going on here, you know, so she's like, this is not right, something's happened. Hare Krishna. And realizes it's not the husband. So, who are you? If you're not my husband, who are you? And then Vishnu is like, you know, oh, you got me, Krishna, you got me. So, reveals his form. And rather than us, who I imagine if we'd performed some austerity and then Krishna comes before us in his form, you'd be pretty happy. You'd be pretty excited about the whole situation. But she wasn't. She was furious. Absolutely furious because she was such a chaste and such a loving, faithful wife and devotee like this so no one gets in the way of her chastity like this and to be fooled like that she turns around to Krishna or to Vishnu in this circumstance and says only someone with a heart of stone could do this someone who's stone hearted not someone loving so she cursed Krishna she cursed Vishnu and not only did you know just curse him he accepted and said well you know kind of fair play you know but since he knows past present and future understands that this is pastime Leela and says, okay, I'll become stone, but you in your next life, so we can be reunited because he understood her true desire, which was to be united. You will be the Gandaki River. The hairs of your body will be Tulsi, as we see before us here. And Krishna will be, or Vishnu will be, Shaligram. Shaligram Shilas. So these stones we find the Gandaki River, you can see there's some devotees here on the farm that have Shaligram service. And Tulsi is so intimately united. Won't continue on too much down that path because that's beyond my adhikar. But that's what I understand that how Tulsi and Vishnu or Krishna became so intimately united in this pastime and how Tulsi manifested in this form as a plant or as a tree. Okay? So Prabhupada was so. Um, oh, I did that whole thing without looking at it. Prabhupada was so eager for us to, uh, us as devotees in his Krishna consciousness movement, to have Tulsi worship. It's highlighted in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Rupa Goswami talks about the importance of Tulsi Arati. It's not just a 
time filler to have Tulsi Arati in the morning as part of Mangal Arati. It's something very auspicious. It's something very necessary. So much so that when the fourth canto was being written, fourth canto, eight chapter, 55th verse, please forgive me, I don't know the Sanskrit, but in the purport, particularly Prabhupada glorifies his disciple, Srimati Govinda, Govinda Dasi. Uh, Govinda Dasi saying that she was the one that propagated the first seeds in Krishna consciousness outside of India and actually allowed Tulsi to be spread like this in all centers around the world. You know, it's amazing when I was looking at this, you could see these, these parts of the world that you would think there's, there's no business for plants to be growing as well as they're growing, but they are because the devotion is so strong. Prabhupada is emphatic about having to have a certain standard of devotional service for Tulsi to flourish, and we see that. And so all glories to the Tulsi saver devotees here. In this verse, in that fourth canto, Krishna himself is saying how dear Tulsi is to him. In this verse, we see that Tulsi is so dear to uh, Vishnu in this case, because we're in Vaikuntha. It says, Tulsi is given special preference by the Lord who garlands himself with Tulsi leaves. So we can understand also in the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna says, Patram Pushvam Alam Toyam, that it's offering a leaf, flower, a water, that's wonderful time, place, circumstance, what you've got around you, but in essence, Tulsi leaves is key. Tulsi leaves is what's most important in this situation. That's really what's being referred to, and if we can, Hare Krishna. I was talking with some of the devotees who've been looking after Tulsi here, and it's quite amazing, actually, how intimate the service is, how much reciprocation she gives, how much she will like, reciprocate with where you're at, you know? I'm noticing that at home at the moment. Uh, nonetheless, Tulsi is all around us, not as far as it's all one. That was a bit of a wild statement to me. We chant on Tulsi, we wear Tulsi, we circumambulate Tulsi. I always thought it was funny to think that somewhere, always around the world, someone's dancing around the Tulsi tree. I think that's kind of funny. But anyway. So the austerities that Tulsi performed uh, is nice to know. It's always important to find out why we are doing these things and the importance behind it. So as I said, there's much more to it, but I'm realizing that time is moving very fast. So I'll move on to the next point, which is perhaps a little bit more practical for us on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour sense, which is the non-envious nature of those in the spiritual sky. So that's mentioning that not only is it the flowers are non-envious, in yesterday's verse, the birds are non-envious, which means that in the spiritual sky, if everything's conscious, got a personality, the rocks would be non-envious, the water sources would be non-envious. What to speak of the personalities like people are in Vaikuntha, the forearm forms, and then especially what to speak of Goloka Vrindavan, how much envy they must have? Nil, wa. Transcendental envy, but that's another deviation of the topic. So we won't go down there just yet. Um, Unfortunately for us, since envy is the beginning of material existence or material nature, it is inherent in us to have envy. And when we really stop and think about what envy is, Envy another devotee is envy of Krishna. Because Krishna is the one that has given us these qualifications, these looks, these skills, this place that we're born. In the Ishapanishad, Krishna says that he is the control, the maintainer, but more importantly, there is a quota given. There is a quota given to all of us at the time of, well, us being here. So if we have a quota, why should I chase after someone else's quota or be unhappy that they have something more that I don't have? That's envy of others and envy of Krishna saying that I know best or I want more than what Krishna is going to give me. And so that's not particularly Vaikuntha consciousness. How to... 
yeah, rise above having this envious nature. Srila Prabhupada elaborate, uh, elaborately describes this in many different ways. Especially, uh, essentially, it's chant Hare Krishna, but not just flippantly, non-offensively, the first offense, you know, to blaspheme devotees. It's, it's literally the first point. So it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of right in front of us, but it's very easy to do. So there was a story I heard by uh, His Holiness Radhanath Swami Maharaj. He was giving an anecdote about when Prabhupada was still here, at least in his physical form. He was getting into, into his car. I'm not sure which temple. But he was getting into his car to leave. And this man was chasing, chasing, chasing down. Like, Swamiji, Swamiji, Swamiji. How do I become Krishna conscious? I mean, how would you answer that in a short snippet? I mean, would it just be chant? Would it associate here nicely? Sarvadamam pritya jamame kam sharanam vraja. You know, like hit him on the back of the head with a Bhagavad Gita and say surrender to Krishna, you know? Rascal. Like, maybe. <laughs> it depends on the person, I suppose. But no, it was much simpler. And this is the qualification of someone who is so exalted as Srila Prabhupada. He could condense everything into one word. And it was desire. I'm sure there were many. I know there were many more opportunities for Prabhupada to give you know, all this nectar. I mean, literally every word of this is Prabhupada's nectar. But in this particular instance, I thought that was quite profound. One word. Desire. To desire. To desire what? To desire a bigger house, more cars, more fancy dhotis, a bigger kantimala, you know, like all this stuff. I got pretty fired up when I was in my board trying to find the biggest possible Tulsi root necklaces I'm wearing. I'm literally wearing it. I got really fired up before and I put it on. I was like, yes. That's my quota, Prabhu. I'm allowed it. So we must desire to be Krishna conscious. And that means to be non-envious. So mm, Krishna says in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Boga Aishvarya Prashaktanam Tayapa Hrita Jetasam Vyavasayat Makabudi Samadona Vidi Vidyate Vidyate. That one stumped me when I was doing my shlokas. I was always vidyate. I'm like, you're too Australian. It's vidyate. Anyway, Bhagavad Gita, Prashaktana. So we get too attached to material, material things. And then with that attachment, that's not the literal translation, but we get too attached to material sense enjoyment. And with that sense enjoyment, our minds become bewildered. And then with that bewildered mind, our determination for devotional service goes. So we have to have that determination, the desire, the understanding that what's it going to take to remove ourselves from this problematic situation that we're in. And it seems all roads lead to envy, not Rome, envy. They got it wrong. So recently, there was the glorious disappearance day celebrations of Jainanda Thakur. And one of my favorite stories of his, and the reason this comes in, is a situation just like this. He would be sitting in the class, and then there would be some, someone or other Krishna Das on the, on the Vyasa San. And he would sit there in this sweet mood, genuinely inquiring from the person on the Vyasa San giving class. Even though he was, we, we hear all these stories, how incredibly surrendered he was to Srila Prabhupada, the realizations he must have had would have been so significant. You know, this really elevated but humble personality there with this complete display of non-enviousness would sit there and inquire, like, please tell me this. Not as a tell me because I, I know the answer already. It was just very much like you're doing your service and I want to encourage you, I want to support you, I want to see you succeed. That's, uh, for me, I think that, that was, when I read this verse, that was one of the key things that came to my mind, especially since we'd just uh, spoken about him so recently. There's a phrase that I uh, heard a little while ago. 
It's not a Shastrik Praman, so I hope this isn't going to kick me out of ISKCON, but it's that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Why that is a thing to say is what right do we have to be this envious nature of someone else and say, oh, they've got more, I'm going to cut them down, I want to I want to see them not have that because I can't have it either or I don't have it or you're doing really well and you're feeling all, you know, you've got tickets on yourself and then you see someone around the corner and they've got one extra ticket and you know, oh, this sucks, you know, like that, it's, it's silly, it's nonsense, but it's in us, it's our, it's our material uh, consciousness that we have. It comes down to a lot of being on the bodily platform, you know, we are spirit souls. I'm sure we can all hear, clear as day, Srila Prabhupada's voice, you are not the body, you are spirit soul. It's just like, it's, it's there. I'm sure it's the same with pretty much everyone who's heard these classes. You are not the body, you're a spirit soul, you're not the body, you're a spirit soul. So it's like, okay, great, sounds nice, sounds interesting, I can kind of get my head around, but how does that actually impact us and how has that got anything related to envy and being on the material platform. Well, if we're on the spiritual platform, we wouldn't be so attached to all these things that we're going to be envious of. So I'm spirit soul, but I'm looking at you as a material person, as a material you know, object for my enjoyment, for my you know, collection. Right? No, para versus apara prakriti, but maybe that's a bit too much. You know, we're coming in as a spirit soul from Krishna's superior energy and now we're interacting with the material nature so it's of course we're going to feel like we can lord it over it because in essence we are you know coming at it from this other angle saying we should have more it's like well yeah get out of here <laughs> go to go to go to the spiritual world and you will have more but you'll have it in this non-envious nature mm. at the beginning of the ninth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, even Krishna says to Arjuna, I am giving you this knowledge because you are non-envious of me. So it's sort of sown all through our, our teachings here. Don't be envious and you can actually receive the information of Krishna consciousness and actually perform your duties nicely and then just thus, be done. Each morning we're reciting the Shikshastika. Well, Trying anyway, regardless, every morning we're, we're reciting the Shikshastika prayers and it says, Na Danam, Na Janam, Na Sundaram. And then what do you get? Chanting in a humble state of mind. And yet we want Danam, we want Janam, we want Sundaram, and still to be able to chant in a, whole, uh, in a humble state of mind. It's just not how it works, it's just not the formula. Like, yes to Danam. Yes to Janam, yes to Sundarim, yes to humble chanting. It's like it doesn't, it's not, it's literally that, like it's not how it's presented to us. So we've got to understand how we can best approach our day to day life to become humble, to become non envious. Prabhupada says that envy is surmountable through bhakti. So through devotional service, it'll take us out of this material consciousness, become like a flower in Vaikuntha, I suppose. Become like a bird in Vaikuntha, you know? But like just ri rise out of these three modes and, and, uh, and be grateful for what we have. This is a lot. You know, actually be grateful and humbled that look around at where we are. There's so many blessings coming to us all the time. Krishna wants us to come home so desperately and providing so many tools for us to do so, so many interactions, such sangha, you know, just even being able to be here and do this is so rare and so special and then to go out and then be envious of someone else, it kind of doesn't, it like misses, it doesn't really match. So we've got to practice it continuously. I mean, what does Prabhupada say? Your love will be shown to me by? That's right. Cooperation. Cooperation with envy. No, non-envy. Cooperation. So you cooperate because you're supporting one another. 
Like this, literally these 11 flowers, I don't need to list them again because I'll be another 10 minutes. But to, to, to go, I am performing some service and then here is someone else and I recognize that they perform these amazing austerities. Even if they haven't, the fact that they're here, I want to encourage them in their, in their service to Krishna. I see that they are dear to Krishna and I want to you know, fan the spark, fan the spark. There's this really beautiful letter that I'll conclude with that I found this letter uh, that Prabhupada sent to uh, Madhavananda in 1974 on the 6th of October. It says, we should utilize our talents without being envious of others. You should do your best, but you should not be envious of others. In material life, there is simply envy of others' progress. But in spiritual life, one encourages another. Oh, you are doing very nice. That is Radharani. She says, oh, here is a very nice devotee. Please, Krishna, you accept him. I don't know, I thought that was pretty sweet anyway. If I'm not jealous, I'm in the spiritual world, he says. But if you are jealous, you are very much firmly planted in the material world. And that's not necessarily where we're trying to stay. We're trying to elevate ourselves. So. Uh, with that, I've reached the end of my thoughts. So I'll recite or read this verse again and see if there's any comments or corrections from you. Although flowering plants like the mandara, kunda, kurabaka, utpala, champak, arna, punaga, naga, keshara, bakula, lili, and parijata are full of transcendental fragrance, they are still conscious of the austerities performed by Tulsi, for Tulsi is given special preference by the Lord who garlands himself with Tulsi leaves. Hare Krishna. Does anyone want to chime in? Whoa. Try. You mentioned in your class how envy is the beginning of material life. Mm. Um, but at the same time, we read a lot that there is no envy in the spiritual world. And originally, we were all there, right? So how do we get envious if envy does not enter the spiritual world and we were all originally in the spiritual world? So we hear that there is a transcendental enviousness, not in any which way or shape or form that we experience it here. I'm sure you've heard of the envy between the gopis. You know, it's like, oh, you're performing such nice service for Krishna. Let me also perform even nicer service for Krishna. So it's like this, like, you, know, you see, jump in there and perform some extra like this. That's the example at least given in the highest, highest level. But how can we develop the envy to bring us to this material world? Somehow or other, we've fallen into this ocean of birth and death. I really wish I could give you a succinct answer, and particularly from this spot in the temple, I can't. Um, I understand that there is one train of thought that says, you know, how we ended up here and another, but I, I, I don't have a qualification to uh, discuss it. But yeah, I, it's, it's a hard one to understand how could we be in a place where there's zero envy and then end up here like encapsulated in envy and keeping us here. I, I don't have a full answer for you, but thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Prabhu? Thank you for the great question, Shringa. That was amazing. I was just going to ask if you had any realizations on what the transcendental fragrance, what would that, what would that be? <laughs> well, it's a yes and no answer, so that's particularly unhelpful for you. When I've, hmm, 
What is a transcendental fragrance that I've come across? Uh, okay, the bathing oil of Nishingadev in Mayapur. So there are certain things where it's not particularly a smell or flavor or something you can put your finger on. You know. But the fact that it's touched the body of the Lord and then you get the remnants. It's like Charnamrita, like what, what, what possible flavor is that? What smell is that? Like it's honey, but it's not. It's yogurt, it's milk, not spices. You know? So it's kind of hard to particularly pinpoint, but in my experience or my realization is when, yes, in the morning when you're in the mode of goodness, when you've actually been sincerely practicing and chanting some very good rounds, hearing nicely, reading nicely, and you can feel pretty, pretty good, you know, pretty Krishna conscious, dare I say it. But as you're doing that in the mornings, literally you can walk past you, like Tulsi is a beautiful fragrance. But then other times when the consciousness maybe isn't so much there, it's just take it or leave it. It's not, you don't really, so, you don't really assimilate it too much. You don't notice it so much. So I think even having awareness of some of the transcendental things that we have access to in the mornings, you know, you get the oil from the Shingadev like that, but then you go where it's blown out of like into a whole other scale. Like in India, you just walk around. I mean, perhaps you would call Vrindavan streets a transcendental fragrance, would you? Anyone who's... <laughs> the open sewage drains and... You know, walking through Black Sludge in Loy Bazaar and you're like, oh, I wonder what that is. And then you learn what it is and you go, oh, it's, you've got to be pretty transcendental to deal with it. But yeah, that, that's sort of it. Like when, you, when, you, when you're working on your Krishna consciousness, you can appreciate these smells or these experiences that we actually have more so having the awareness. You know, why is the flower offered to Krishna? And then we come and do it like this smell it from a distance, it's nothing. It's like, but you go up and you go, oh wow, you know, it's actually Krishna has enjoyed this being offered to him. You know, you can have this consciousness that actually allows you to connect with the, the item more than just going, oh yeah, that's nice. So that would be a, some kind of answer. Is that okay? All right. Yeah. Do it. Heavy. I just, uh, <laughs> I'll just a bit of a comment. Um, you were saying how we should see other devotees in a non-envious way, mm. and I kind of was getting flashbacks of uh, when we went up north, when we were in the Brahmacharya ashram together. We went doing books and kirtan during COVID to get away from the madness. We seen how. Uh, how difficult it is to come across favorable people in, uh, towards Krishna consciousness. And you would come across one or two each day and would call them dry grass because you just kind of fan them a little bit and poof, they become a light. And sometimes we forget in our everyday life within community settings that everyone who has taken the Krishna consciousness their dry grass have taken to the process and um, we should really nurture each other and fan each other's sparks and that's when it comes to you know humility and non-envious uh, and there's a I was also thinking about letter by Srila Prabhupada and he said that devotees are better than kings you know if they get that we may have our some impurities some scratches on us you know every moon has its like <laughs> blotches uh, but yeah, just do our best to see each other's best qualities and just really support each other because to become Krishna consciousness within this world, it's actually quite a rare thing. I remember myself and KG, we sat down when we were trying to crunch the numbers, we were trying to do a mathematical equation, you know, how many devotees, you know, compared to the amount of people on the planet, and it's a very small amount. So yeah, just to support each other and um, yeah, fan each other's sparks. Yeah, it's the best thing we can do for each other. And by doing that, then we encourage those who are new to Krishna consciousness or uh, are looking within our community and Krishna consciousness in general. Thanks for the class. I really enjoyed it. It was amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Prabhu. Hadi Bo. Hadi Bo. Yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, it's, if, uh, if we had to wait for qualified people to encourage, 
what would Srila Prabhupada have done when he got off the Jaladuta and met with a whole bunch of hippies? I mean, what qualification is that? But they were, they, you know, they listened, they tried, you know, and Prabhupada was fixed. He was determined. He had the message, message of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur with him always, just, like, you know, go to the West and preach, you know, like this. So this, what a position to take, non like, yeah, non envious and humility and just the determination, the desire for for encouraging people in something they're not even knowing about. Like you say, Krishna Village is, is a perfectly prime example. I mean I I came through that program. I was a volunteer that came in. I was a broken husk of a person, you know, when I came in here. Oh well, you know. I didn't know a dang thing about Krishna consciousness, but I was taken under the wings of some really particularly wonderful devotees and just encouraged and with some agata sukriti and you know a little bit of spices and all things nice it's like the system works so it's really up to us to to make those steps and not say well i'm on the vyasasan i don't need to go and talk to some hippies like come on that, that's not the point that's not the point of the mission so absolutely as padma said you know you go out on books and you can you know one out of ten people might say yes to listening. What to speak of taking a book? <laughs> you know? <laughs> that is a laugh of a man who knows exactly what I'm talking about <laughs> through experience. You know, it's blissful. Blissfully performed when we're actually performing it. You know? It's like that. Thanks, Padma. I'm very good. Is there anything else? Yes, bro. Um, bro, I just thought I'd throw another spin on the, the question that was asked. Because mm. um, you were saying there are different sort of trains of thought or schools of thought of how, why we came here. Mm. And um, I've asked Bano, uh, His Holiness Bano Swami about this and he was saying that there's uh, nitya butters and, and nitya siddhas. Right. And if you're a nitya butter, you are always here. You're actually never in the spiritual world. And you will never leave. Um, which then I was talking to another devotee about this who said, uh, it was quoting uh, His Holiness Gorga Vinda Maharaj, who said that the only way to leave is actually through um, uh, siddha kripa. So the mercy of the of the the pure devotees, right. really, like like Prabhupada. So I just thought I'd throw that. You could, if, please comment on that if, <laughs> if you like. I just thought I'd throw that in there as well, just because that's uh, something that I struggled with for a lot of years. Was sure. how did we fall if if uh, there is no envy in in the spiritual world? And yeah, so the sort of come to that uh, that being given that answer that basically we were never there. We're always here, unless we're like. Srila Prabhupada, who came down because he's a, a Nietzsche sitter. But, uh, yeah. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Gorgavinda Swami. Amazing. Unbelievable. Jiva Tattva Ki Jai. question as to how do we end up here, how do we come here? Find it that it's, it's not quite so important. Standing out in the middle of the ocean and um, we have to help. You want to get out of there, you want to be ready. How did I get here? That's right. Uh, 
I love that. Take the floating and get out of here. And as my spiritual master would say, go back and ask him yourself. Go to Goloka and ask Krishna yourself. And then by then, who cares? You're back. Hare Krishna, Grantaraj, Srimad Bhagavatam, Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. I'm doing it's like I need to talk about both, but also you could give a whole seminar on one or the other, you know. Check it out. I told you I fixed the Jeep situation. 